Stop messing around, stop fooling around, stop delaying, stop procrastinating. Get up, get out, get it done. Everything is possible, nothing is a problem, and anything can be overcome. I just get my ass up out of bed, I get my shit together, and I get out and I start the fight. And that will transform you from uh, a mere mortal into a superhuman being. I've never, ever, ever met anybody who told me that they got rich watching their IRA or their 401k. Welcome back, Peter. Happy Wednesday. George, what's up, man? Not too much. It's a beautiful day again, and uh, let's get after it. What are we doing today? Today we're reacting to Will Smith. Will Smith. Oh, boy, you're giving me a Will Smith clip? Yes, indeed. Willard Smith. Can I make a Will Smith joke? Sure, if you want to. I won't do it. I won't do it. (laughs) He's from Philadelphia. I'm going to give him a break. Yeah, you can do whatever you want. It's your show. And I I think he's done a good job of letting it all die down, the dust settling a little bit, because he's been... Mellow the yeah, past bunch of months. Slap, uh, he's done an impressive Boy, damage control job. What a, what a rough road he's right. been on since that. Yeah, I don't yeah, I envy that. But yeah. all right, let's see. What, right, let's, let's see what, what Will's saying. By the way, before yeah, you start it, totally. he always sounds so great, intelligent, mm-hmm. like a lot of wisdom. So I don't know what you're about to play for me, but I, I think he's generally an interesting guy to listen yeah. to. No, totally. All right, let's get into it. All right. It. There's a, a redemptive power that making a choice. Mm. You know, rather than feeling like you're choice. at a, effect to all the things that are happening. Options, choices. A choice. Yeah. Right? You just decide what it's going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to do it. Just decide. Beautiful. And then from that point, the universe is going to get out your way. Beautiful. Man, I mean, so to my point, right? Yeah. It sounds great. I love this. I could listen to that kind of stuff all day long. And I'm a big fan of options and choices. I feel like people need to make choices and make decisions. And I feel like the more options that are available to us in life, the better life is. I think to me, life is all about options. And I'm always looking to increase the number of options I have with everything on a day-to-day basis. Options, little day-to-day choices and decisions. The more options I have, the better, but I have to know how to make a decision and make that choice and move forward. I'm all for that. You know, he says something. He says, you got to make a choice and the world's going to get out of your way. That's big stuff. That was the part that I wondered if I believe that or not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I don't. I just need to think about it. Well, the subtext of that, I mean, he's giving this passionate speech about making choices and the world's going to get out of your way. Look, I think we all know that the world is not going to get out of your way unless we make it get out of our way. Yeah, maybe that's what he's getting at, is making the choice. But he's got a lot of energy in what he's saying. For me, what I'm getting from that is be really decisive, be really strong, be really confident, execute, put your power out there. The world's going to get out of your way. I don't think it's like, oh, I'm going to go have a milkshake today, (laughs) and then the Red Sea parts, and you go get your milkshake. I don't think he's saying that. Do you feel like early on in the day, I feel like the day is easier. Maybe this is what he's talking about. The day is easier for me when I make a bunch of decisions early on in the day rather than hold them till maybe yeah, maybe. or something like that. I, yeah. I think he's saying make decisions. Yeah. Any time of the day, yeah. make decisions. Big, small, early, late, yeah. make decisions. Have options mm-hmm. available to you. Decide what the best option is. I mean, that's what I get from it. And uh, it's good stuff. You want to uh, read this next tweet from, this is Casey Miracle. You want me to read this tweet? Yeah. I, I have to do all the work lately. Well, I can, I, do, you I put, can do it if you like. God, but, but. Damn, I got to read the <laughs> tweets too? This is from Casey Miracle. Yeah. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Casey says, no guy with a thousand plus units, multifamily and single family. All leases are month to month. Anytime a tenant bothers him, he just gives 30 days notice of a rent raise. Calls it his PETA fee. Filters out the bad apples. Would you do this? Why or why not? Oh, man. <laughs> You're making me talk about uh, another peer's tactics yeah. in running their business. Mm-hmm. I, look. We all get a little worn out, no matter what your role in life is and what business you're in. We all get a little worn out at some point. I think what what Casey's saying here is that this person just got sick of the phone ringing. So said, you know what? If you're going to call me, I'm going to raise your rent. Sort of a dick move, right? (laughs) Sounds dickish to me. A little bit. 
Uh, not how I roll, but I can appreciate the up to the earsedness mm. that that person seems to present. Yeah, they probably just had enough of it. Yeah, I don't think it's the right. Well, look, they have a thousand units. Probably not the right business for them if they can't tolerate people calling them. George, I want people to call us. I want people to ask for help. I want people to say what they need because I want to be able to give them what they need. I'm in business to give value, to give you what you need. That's the relationship. I need that relationship. George, at some point, the tenants are going to get sick of this. They're going to get sick of him and they're going to vacate and go to a competing property at some point. Yeah. You can't be like that for the long term. That's what I thought you'd say, but I was curious. Yeah. So, all right, we'll head over to the table. Thanks, George. Thank you, Peter. All right. Welcome back to the table, Peter. 2022 is a bitch. Uh, probably. <laughs> and if it's not yet, it's going to be tomorrow or the next day. Yeah. That's a quote from Steve Schwatt in a recent New York Times piece about how inflation was hitting mid-sized landlords particularly hard, even as rents go up. Oh, he's referring to mid-sized landlords. Yes, indeed. I can appreciate yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, 2022 is a bitch then. Yeah, so I was wondering, I wanted to talk to you about this because I think a lot of people think, oh, rents are going up, so that must be great for landlords. All the landlords must be making so much money. I had this conversation today with a tax assessor in one of my markets. Mm. He said, Peter, yeah, rents are up another 17% this year. I'm like, yeah, my expenses are up 33%. Right, yeah. Well, but expenses are up as a percentage of income is the response I got. I'm like, yeah, what does that mean? (laughs) Like rents went from like 1,000 to 1,170 and expenses went from, you know, 50 grand to 80 grand. Yeah, are you, you're hearing this across the board from all your peers kind of thing, like... Everything has gone. You know, the only thing that's pulled back is lumber. The price of lumber is down yeah. from where it was at its peak. Yeah. Energy is up. Labor is up. Insurance is up. Banking services. Forget it. These damn banks are like every this. If you breathe on them, they charge you for it. It's crazy. Cabinets, appliances. Appliances are still very expensive and taking longer to get. God forbid you need to deploy any human resources and labor to fix anything. Every all the costs, all the expenses that are related to operating housing. Yeah. Or through the roof. And rents are starting to back off, but the costs are not. Yes, what do you do? What do you like? What, what do you do? What, what do you do? What are you hold on. Yeah. You hope that you can get through it. You make less money. You break even. You lose a little bit and you have to fund the losses out of your own pocket. That's what you do. Right. You raise money from partners and investors and say, Hey guys, I hate to make this phone call, but we need some money because Taxes went up because the tax assessors used the comps from twenty twenty one and the first quarter and a half of twenty twenty two. Yeah. Those are all the pie in the sky comps. Mm-hmm. So we get those comps, but meanwhile, our, ex- our expenses are up 30, 40, 50%, 60% in some categories. That's crazy. It's cr- 100% in some categories. Yeah. Yeah, I've got some categories that are double what they were. You do. As expe- yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. wow, holy shit. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you hold on. You got to raise money. You got to save money. You got to carefully spend whatever little money you may have, but you have to hold on. Right now, we've got incomes rising, the labor market the way it is. Uh, individual incomes have been increasing for, for the first couple of quarters of this year, and I think it's going to continue for the next couple of quarters. But as the recession hits a little deeper and a little harder, I don't know what's going to happen to incomes. It's I've never seen a labor market like this, but I want to be able to charge rents that rise commensurate with incomes. I need to because my expenses are eroding everything that I ever had in terms of profit. And profit's a dirty word. You know, People don't want to know that you're making a profit renting out housing. Look, there's a cost to providing housing to the marketplace. I have a cost. Landlords have a cost. I'd like to have those costs be met. So I'm okay when my profits fluctuate with the market and maybe sometimes I make a little less, sometimes I make a little more. That I'm okay with because I'm a free market advocate. You know that. I'm willing to play by the rules by the free market. Right, well, you I'm, want it to be connected to value. No, like the, I do, right. I do. What, yeah. what I'm not willing to do and less likely to be able to stomach without vomiting is to be subject to non-free market conditions that are regulated, that are restricted. The costs are going up, but I can't get my income to go up. You know, some of my markets are rent regulated, so I'm capped on how much I can charge year over year with rent increases, but my expenses aren't capped. As I said, I've got some that are up 30 60%, 100% in some cases, some line items. You saw a lot of this coming for quite a while. When when did you start to kind of see that this was going to be a thing on the horizon? And like, where did that knowledge come from? I thought I that like- we were overheated in the last quarter of 2019, a few months before the pandemic hit. I thought that asset prices were already too high in the last quarter of 2019 before the pandemic hit. 
And then the pandemic hit, and then everything doubled from there. Are you kidding me? Asset prices are way too high. The money was too cheap. It was too inexpensive. It was free in a lot of cases, right? We all remember that. Everything doubled in price. Now it's going to pull back. Where's it going to pull back to? To 2019 or even earlier than that? George, I think it's going to pull back to levels from 2012, 13, 14, 15. Wow. And that's where I'm looking to yeah. mark asset prices too. The Chicago Tribune reported that the Biden administration is threatening to block millions of dollars yeah. in federal aid to the Chicago, to Chicago uh, unless the mayor... Oh, Mayor Lightfoot. Something. Yes, Mayor Lightfoot. Yeah. And they're accusing her and the administration of discriminatory zoning practices. From a real estate standpoint, what are your thoughts on that? Well, on look, that? I I think you're referring to how Chicago told certain production facilities and manufacturing facilities to relocate to other neighborhoods yes, yeah. that were maybe poor neighborhoods or maybe more black or Latino neighborhoods. Yep. Yeah. So no one wants to feel like discrimination is part of a public administration's agenda when it comes to zoning, right? No one wants to feel that. That's a bad thing. Uh, I don't know the particulars about Chicago. I know that it's tough to find land to build anything on. It's really tough to find land to build housing on. And we need a lot more housing. Chicago needs a lot of housing. Chicago needs a lot of things. It needs safety. It needs... Look, here's what I find ironic about this. I find ironic that the Biden administration is putting the pressure on, on Mayor Lightfoot and her administration. Because the Biden administration, in my opinion, is guilty of, uh, of a lot of things as well. We need zoning reform everywhere, not just in Chicago. But we need zoning reform everywhere. We need to make it easier and more likely for developers to build and for new properties to develop and come out of the ground. We need housing, but we need storage and we need commercial places. We need places to park and charge electric vehicles. All this stuff needs to happen. There's never been such a need like what we're seeing right now for all of these new types of uses for land and buildings and real estate. You have to loosen up the zoning. Chicago probably needs to loosen up their zoning and try to find ways that aren't potentially discriminatory. discriminatory. Right. I mean, yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's a bummer. Yeah, it's an ugly word. Although I will say in fairness that it can be said that anything is discriminatory. I've heard people spin discrimination into like the most mundane and benign of issues. Yeah. I'm wary of that. But, but I do think we need to loosen up zoning everywhere. And if Chicago is having an issue on where to put manufacturing and commercial activity, I mean, they need to figure it out. Maybe it goes a little further outside of the city. Maybe it goes into some land that is not zoned for it currently and they have to make it zoned for it you have to look at zoning all these cities we need like the best planners to look at all the cities everywhere in our country and come up with plans everyone needs a new plan when i say plans i'm talking about city development plans master plans and the zoning map all of that stuff has to get looked at and addressed this stuff has been on the books for decades george decades it's no longer 1970 it's no longer 1950 this is the era of evolution of pivot of new consumer behaviors, post-pandemic population, like all, like we're, everything is different. We're not doing anything the same that we used to. And our land use has to change with it. Back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, it was very restrictive zoning policies. People wanted to build Perfectville everywhere. Yeah. Flowers, schools, beautiful homes, green grass, lawn irrigation. Uh, it was the American dream at its peak. That was the era. Then things started to change. You got into the 90s, the houses that were in most neighborhoods were already 30, 40 years old. People had to knock down and build new. And that's when all of this stuff started to happen with housing unaffordability because there was no place to build new. You had to knock down the existing home and build a new home. You couldn't just go to another part of town and build a development or build a house that you wanted to. Zoning didn't permit it. Zoning doesn't permit a lot of things. You need to loosen and unrestrict our very restrictive zoning rules that exist everywhere. Chicago, good luck with it. I mean, you're already a densely populated city. You've got a lot of stuff going on. It's a complex place, and there's a lot of moving parts, but they need to figure that out. But I love that the Biden administration is the one criticizing Chicago for discriminatory zoning practices. Well, I think to your point, in using the word discriminatory, language is important, and you know, you shouldn't use words that mean something. If you mean something else, you should say that. But yeah, I think a lot of times people use the words discriminatory or racist or whatever, you know, sexist. Usually yeah. they mean you're a bad person. That's usually yeah, what you're a bad person. Is. And the definition is little is a little soft. You're a uh, bad so, person. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I yeah. would be and the the uh, the alternative thought path in me wants to say, I wonder if it's really the 
quote unquote discriminatory zoning practices that the Biden administration is going after, and perhaps there's not something else going on, Another and this is just a motivation. Yeah. subterfuge of yeah. short of sorts. Yeah, I think that's that wouldn't be uh, unusual. Yeah, <laughs> so. We speak frequently about deal volume in commercial real estate being particularly low right now. Volume you know, is low. Cricket. Quite a few times. You got any deals for me? I don't. I'm sorry. But it's if I did have any, I'll, I'll give you a call. This recent article by PropMoto suggested that this is partly due to the difficulty of establishing market comps, uh, like market value through applicable comps, essentially. Um, they were talking about earnouts, which I had never heard of. Uh, so I had to kind of look into it, get into it. But what are your thoughts on earnouts as When you a say earnouts, yeah. are you saying like a seller is selling a property and it's part of the negotiation with the buyer on how it gets paid? Yes, yeah. And so then uh, over time, if the kind of well, economic occupancy is what the seller says it's going to be, <sighs> that it, you know, changes. Wow, is that a, th- a thing? Because I, have, I haven't experienced that yet, although I would love to. I would love to find a seller that's willing to let me pay them out over time mm. contingent upon performance. Right. Like yeah. that would be great. Yeah, well, and that's I can what, get into a property for less. And yeah, well, and that's well, they're they're talking about that risk of you have to make sure that the clauses are tight enough so that the buyer doesn't yeah. then purposefully cause vacancies um, and lower economic. It sounds so, creative yeah. to me. Yeah. It sounds like if you can get that as a buyer, then that's great. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that we're in that kind of market because yeah. even though interest rates are high and deal volumes very low, I just I, I don't know. I mean, I would never be a seller. Right. And say, yeah, pay me a little now, pay me a little next year, pay me a little the year after that. Like, well, yeah. why would I do that? Right. M- maybe someone's going to figure out some tax advantageous reason for doing that. Yeah. But uh, look, as soon as that deed transfers, I as the seller have to pay full vig on taxes. I don't. I don't get to pay taxes a little bit now, a little bit next year, a little bit the year after. I have to pay all of the taxes now, while you pay me a little bit of the money now. More. Le- it makes. It's hit, not really striking me as something that would be astute, but hey, as a buyer, I'm going to try that. I'm going to I'll try I'll try and convince my sellers to let me pay them over time. Yeah, I thought it was an interesting. I had never heard of that wow. suggestion before, and so I don't know if that's actually a real suggestion or something that somebody ideologically. I think is that's a suggestion those, made yeah. by someone who yanked that one out of their schwinker. I'm not seeing <laughs> the real application in that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I just uh, not in my markets. Yeah, All right, we'll we'll pat that and put it aside. Then, Maybe in the swamps yeah. of Mississippi, a seller would be able to do that yeah. because it's better than owning property in the swamps of Mississippi. Yeah. But uh, I don't see it. Our real estate sellers, give us a call. Let us yeah. know. Um, Bloomberg claims in a survey recently that hundred million dollars a year are spent on useless meetings. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just just one hundred million. <laughs> yeah, on it, useless meetings. Yeah, it could be more. I think it's just could be. Yeah. Oh, I bet you it's thousand times that. Yeah, I would imagine. I think it's a billion dollars is wasted in useless meetings, because you have to factor in people's people's time. You have to as- assign some hourly rate yeah. to people's time. You have to factor in all the the connectivity and the. Oh my God! Yeah. You know, you know what would make meetings go so much better? What, what's that? Give it a little bit of thought before you go into the meeting. Like, what do I need to get out of this meeting? Write down the three or five or seven things that you need to get from this meeting. Walk into the room, say, hey, Bob, I'm hoping to accomplish this with you today. I need to do that. And then you get to it. And like you work towards that list of things. And yeah, how, I, I go to you, meetings and like the, get the small talk and the fake <laughs> laughter and the right. and people trying to make jokes so that I laugh so that everyone feels comfortable. Yeah. It's like it's such a waste of friggin time. Yeah, how do you design a meeting to be efficient and effective? I go in prepared. Yeah. I know what I need out of it. I know what I want out of it. I know what my other person in the meeting needs and wants out of it. I just go I give, I get, I give, I get. Thanks. Have a nice day. Love you. Bye. Yeah. Like what, what what's so difficult? Like that's the way. And then I got to get out of that meeting. I got to get back to work. Like I got to go produce and earn and grow and whatever I got to do. Stretch. I bought a stretch thing for my hamstring. You're I do a lot of stretching. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's great. When you're not running a meeting, is there a way that you can kind of like force it in a direction of more efficiency? Yeah. When yeah. I'm not running, when it's someone yeah. else's meeting yeah. and I'm there, yeah. I, st- I have all sorts of little tricks that I do. Oh. Like I'll start, I'll start to cough <clears throat> and then I'll, you know, make my, my presence known. Yeah. And then I'll start to jump in and say, yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Okay. No, no, wait. Just little, little nondescript little phrases and words. And then all of a sudden the attention turns to me because the room thinks I have something really important to say. Mm. And then I say it and then the meeting's over. <laughs> right. It's great. Yeah. But try that. If you feel like you're at a meeting and it's not going the way you need it to and it's dragging on and people are BSing around and 
flapping in the breeze. Just try making little noises, cough, bang on the desk, whatever. Make little phrases. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, okay. And then get into it. You're going to get everybody's focus right on you, and that meeting's going to be over in 20 seconds once you get out what you need to get out. Yeah, I love that. That's great. 100 million. Bloomberg says 100 million 100 wasted million. on, on yeah. unnecessary meetings. Yeah. Yeah, one other thing before we move off meetings is how often do you find you need meetings throughout the week or daily? Like, a like lot. What is the, yeah, what is that schedule like? A lot. Uh, yeah. It's all over the place. And is there a duration that is consistent or is it? As quickly as possible. Yeah, de- yeah dependent. Yeah. I don't want to hang out. Yeah. You don't want to hang out. We're not getting beers and hot dogs. Yeah. Like we need to get the meeting done and we need to go as quickly as possible. People use meetings for, uh, I don't even know what they do in these meetings. I want to talk about Hawaii. Hawaii, uh, I'm fine. Hawaii. How are you? Hawaii. Hawaii. <laughs> I didn't expect that. Uh, Hawaii has both the highest median and highest average home prices in the nation. Really? Not yeah. Connecticut? Uh, no, not Connecticut. I think Connecticut is the county, right? Like New Canaan, I think, is definitely the most expensive okay. county in the country. Um, the policymakers in Hawaii have long blamed this on outsiders coming in and buying houses. Uh, but a recent study came out and shows there's no meaningful correlation between what what, what do the policymakers say the outsiders are doing? Just simply buying property yep, at market just, rate. Just that the volume of outside buyers and tourists are causing these rates to go up. Oh, and is this going to be a conversation like we had with Canada that restricted uh, purchase from foreigners? Like, I think it's a little like that. Yeah. Like yeah. if you don't live in Hawaii, you can't purchase property because yeah, it's gotten too expensive. I think a lot of policymakers are pushing for that. Oof. And yeah, this study is showing there's no correlation between that. Of course there's no correlation. Yeah. Because it's a free market. Yeah. Yeah, do findings like this encourage you that people are waking up to that reality or do you feel it's just frustrating that this conversation has to be had at all? It's frustrating that the conversation has to be had at all. Yeah. I don't think people are waking up. I think people are in denial. It's bananas to me that people don't realize that everything in life, including housing affordability, is completely dictated by supply and demand. Th- that's it. There's nothing else. If you have a low supply and there's a high demand, your housing prices are going to be very high. Hawaii. Outside investors don't have different kinds of money. What does it even mean, an right, outside exactly. investor? Someone that doesn't live in Hawaii that yeah. wants to buy property in Hawaii? Exactly. Hawaii needs people to buy the properties and pay the high prices because they get transfer taxes and they get property taxes and they get all sorts of... There's a whole industry of people people that thrive and live and survive off of real estate sales and and investors and home buyers and title companies and inspectors like they need that they need the markets to be fluid and and active and they they don't need restricted markets i'm not that familiar with hawaii's zoning policies but i know that houses are expensive there and i know that people from the west coast like to go there and buy the expensive homes I, you know god bless if they want the properties to be less expensive, figure out how to zone for more properties, figure out how to build affordable housing. I mean, we need housing of all income types and all product types. So the expensive stuff, the inexpensive stuff, the medium stuff, we need it all. Hawaii needs it all. I want to talk about the first 90 days of a deal. Uh, obviously, you know, we talked about after vol- I close on a deal, I, the I, first 90 days. Yeah, yeah I know we said volume is low right now, but you've done hundreds, maybe thousands of deals over the course of your career. When you lock up a multifamily deal, what are some commonalities in those first 90 days that you have to run through and execute on? And Just want to be clear. Are we yeah. talking about when I get it under contract or I've already closed and I own it? Under contract. Under contract. Yeah. The second you lock a property up under contract, the clock starts ticking. Your due diligence period starts. If you have a financing period, that starts, usually runs concurrent with due diligence. It's a three-ring circus, George. Hopefully, you have a seller that's a professional seller that's organized that can just funnel all this stuff to you in a data room or something like that. You got to get your hands on the meters, the utility accounts. You have to get all the third-party reports, appraisals, environmental reports, engineering reports, physical needs assessments. They're all going to come in and tell you what's right and what's wrong with this building. Uh, You have to interview tenants. You have to get the download from the seller on like who's what in this building. I mean, you have to figure all that out. You have to get your zoning analysis. All this has to happen in like 30 days or 45 days or 15 days, whatever, but like fast. And it's a, it's a lot. It's like you're, you're jumping through a lot of hoops. Then you close on the building. Now it's yours. Now you got to show up and work. You got to collect rents. You have to interface. Now they're your tenants. You have to interface with your tenants. You have to figure out who's who and what's what because now you're the manager. You're going to learn all sorts of new things now that you're owning and managing it. It's a sprint. After the closing occurs and probably two quarters into owning the building now for the first time, things will even out and mellow out. But 
from the time you sign the contract to the time you close to about six months after you close, it's a bit of a ruckus. Yeah. Everything is an opportunity. One of our what key, makes you say that? key mantras. Well, you make me say that because that's one of our key mantras at Siegel Capital. That's, everything's that, an opportunity. Yeah, was, I think that was actually episode number one of Daily Cash Flow. Uh, everything is an opportunity. Everything, yeah, everything we is. We talked about it. Now, maybe you can see it or maybe you can't, but everything's an opportunity. Well, that's what I wanted to ask is right now, you know, so many of our conversations and yeah, I think conversations with almost everyone are a little bit bleak economically. And... It's easy to say like, oh, well, just there's nothing out there. We're stuck in this position. George, you know what? In July, you can sell air conditioners for a high price. In December, you can buy air conditioners for a low price. Yeah. See what I'm saying? I do. Everything's an opportunity. When tragedy strikes, God forbid, I'm not saying I wish tragedy on anybody, but when tragedy strikes, there's opportunities, opportunities to help people. There's opportunities to do business. So many opportunities from things that are horrible. Yeah. There's opportunities. Well, strength in relationship, I think, in, particularly in that situation. Today's world, with what's happening in our economy and politically, there's so many opportunities. People are behaving differently. People are spending money differently. People are working differently. They're living differently. They're eating differently. There's opportunity in all of that. Where are you going to insert yourself in that chain of events to take advantage of it? Are you going to sit idly by and just watch and be like, oh, Things are different. I don't know what, like, what are you going to do about it? Everything's an opportunity. The question is, are you going to see it and are you going to take action? But I think everything's an opportunity. When it's sunny out, it's a beautiful day. I can enjoy the day. When it's raining out, I can sell umbrellas. Does that vision just come from asking the question, what's the opportunity here? Oh, man. It it comes from just seeing it. Like, we all have the ability. It's just, but no one takes action. I think we need to take more Mm. action. Decide. Yeah. Decide. Yeah. Choices. Yeah. We were talking about choices. Options. Choices. Decide. You got to take action. Nothing happens without you taking action. Everything's an opportunity. Come on, people. Get off your asses. Take some action. There's opportunity everywhere. I don't care where you live. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what your state of affairs is, how much money you make at your job or you want to make at your job or whatever. If your health is good, if your health is poor, if your family's great, if you had a rough ride growing up, doesn't matter. There's opportunity everywhere. Are you going to let all this stuff hold you back? Or are you going to take action? I mean, that's how I look at it. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to sit by and just watch and talk about it? I'm not a sit by kind of guy. So I, I, I think everything's an opportunity. I mean, I see nothing but opportunity every time I go anywhere in any day of my life. It's just I see, see it. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do about it. I'm going to go over to Q&A and ask you a question. But before we do that, Anything else you want to talk about before we head over there? I have nothing else. You've been very thorough. Thank I've you. enjoyed this. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I appreciate that you're not wearing a bright primary color. Yeah, today. I went with very uh, kind of toned down tones today. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so you're welcome. All right. Well, thanks so much. And thanks, I'll see you next All right, Peter, Q&A. George, let's go. All set. This is from Tim Carroll. And Tim says, hey, Peter, been following you for the last year. Been learning a lot. Thank you. I'm starting to dip my toe in the water of real estate investment, looking at a sixplex right now. My question is, what are the most common reasons a deal will fall through and how do I avoid them? Tim, I like that you're looking at a sixplex. I like that you want to get into real estate. I like that you want to get into multifamily. Tim, you got to be careful right now because our market, our economy, the conditions that we're operating in have crested and they're on the downturn. And now is not the time to be buying market rate multifamily. So if the six family that you're looking at buying is severely depressed in value because rents are very low or because of some other factor that's keeping the property value down and you feel like you have a path to increasing the value of this property, go for it. But for you and for everybody else out there who's thinking about getting into multifamily or investment real estate where you're going to charge rents right now, you have to understand the markets are shifting beneath our feet very fast and very significantly right now as we speak. Every second that goes by, interest rates go up and pricing of assets goes down. All assets I'm talking about, real estate, alternative assets, equities, whatever, prices of assets are going down because the cost of money is going up. That's the correlation. You got to be really careful. So if you have some unique situation that is not correlated to the rest of the market and the aggregate economic market that we're in right now, go for it, pursue it. But if it's correlated to the market and it's a market rate deal and there's already market rate rents, I would think twice. 
save your money, look for something else. All right. Watch your back, Tim. And thank you, Peter. I'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. If you like what you just heard, you can subscribe to The Daily Cash Flow on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And we'd love it if you left us a comment or review. You can follow us on TikTok and Twitter at SiegelCap and on Instagram at Siegel.cap. As always, if you're an accredited investor, go to SiegelCapital.com and take our survey to see if you qualify to take part in one of our apartment building deals. That's S-I-E-G-E-L Capital.com.